Welcome to the MMA Prospectus. This is Zane Simon. I'm joined by Tom Grant, my esteemed co-host, as always. And we are looking, mostly we've got, if ever there is the definition of a non-fight week, this is a non-fight week. Not just not UFC, but not World Series of Fighting, not Bellator, no, not... I don't even know. Is there like a major Russian card this week? Even? No, there's not even like an ACB card this week or anything like that big. It's 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 pretty empty this week. You know what, Zane? They know it's my wedding anniversary, so they cleared up this weekend for me. That's very kind of them. Yeah, very very kind. It's the, the MMA community never never you know never fails to just surprise you with their compassion. Oh, of course, absolutely. I like you know a card every freaking weekend <laughs> when it's my wedding anniversary. Finally one year where I'm not like, you know, getting in trouble for checking my phone. <laughs> well, on that note, because <laughs> it's almost a complete non-event week and I don't want to get into Tom's relationship troubles. Um, <laughs> we are going to focus on UFC 199 mostly and then a few people kicking around the regional scene that are fighting this weekend that we that caught our eye um most particularly how i feel like i should have taken a, a lesson on how to say this before we did the show because i don't feel like i should just be saying kike like that doesn't feel like i think that's right kike brito yeah but kike brito yeah. um brazilian fighter that dude has highlight well. written all over him um, it looks like he's got some serious Yair yeah, Rodriguez thing going on. Yeah. So I uh, we'll, we'll be talking about him first and foremost of the regional prospects along with a few others. But I want to start the show off just by dropping back in on UFC 199 and um, probably most importantly, Jessica Andrade, I got to say. I mean, obviously Max Holloway, he, he's... The, the most notable prospect on the card, but he's also kind of at the edges of what we consider prospectum. He's been fighting for quite a while now, and he's nearing the very elite of his division, so it's not like there's a lot more for him to develop in terms of, you know, he's, he's arrived as a yeah. prospect. I'm, I'm still know. like, you know I'm okay with like following some of the guys that yeah. we talked about into like, the beginning of their, like, not just the beginning of their peaks, but, like, into their peaks a bit. Um, mm -hmm. And it, Max Holloway's been a really cool experience for MMA fans because we watched him go from Dustin Poirier's grappling dummy four years ago into one of the elite strikers in the sport who just dismantles people. I mean, like, yep. he took Ricardo Lamas apart. Uh, and yeah, he had, he had a picture-perfect game plan for Lamas, um... You know, Lamas is such an opportunist, and it was it was so great to me to see that fight because it was a perfect example of every time Holloway fought safe and fought smart, he absolutely dominated Lamas. And you're like, oh, how is Lamas a top, you know, top five ish, top ten ish fighter getting dominated so badly? And then the moment Holloway opened up his offense even a little. Lamas was right there waiting to pounce on him and hurt him and make it a competitive fight. And that's it's a great example of why Lamas is where he is and how good Holloway has become. Yeah. And can we talk about the ending of that fight for like five seconds? How yeah. how awesome. It's just like point of spot, like, no, let's just stay here and sling. And yeah, I that, mean that was awesome. Max Holloway yeah, you, Max Holloway has is quickly becoming the complete package for MMA fans. You've got to rec you know, you've got to recognize that Holloway, you know, how awesome it is for a guy, a, a fighter like Holloway, to not only spend the time to hone his craft and become a very careful, consistent, and um, dominating fighter, but to also have that in him to just be like, no, let's just let's just sit here and throw down and. Do you know? Let whatever happens happen, and throw caution to the wind, and put on a show. That's the ideal. It's certainly the ideal the UFC wants out of their fighters. Yeah, and it's the ideal that fans want too. Is that idea that you're not just watching 
a great technician hone their craft and cruise to decisions over their opponents because they have them beat as easily as they possibly can, but to also just be like, and I want to demolish you as well. So let's just sit here and throw hands and find out who's tougher. Yep. It, it, so, he, he's a guy, I mean, like he's Hawaiian, man. They're yeah. They, anyone who will tell you that back when, back when the Hawaii scene was hopping, the, the most insane events went down in Hawaii because man, they love to scrap. Yeah, it's Super Brawl days. Oh, yeah. Rumble but, on the Rock. Uh, yep, Rumble on the Rock, all that great stuff. And it's great It's great to see that that's still, you know, we're still getting that tr t trickle of talent from Hawaii that's consistent of, they just produce a lot of tough dudes that love to scrap. It is less dead, less dead <laughs> than the Japanese scene. It, it's less dead than, like, the, um, oh, fuck, uh, where was Militic that was uh, out of? Iowa, like the Midwest? Yeah, the Iowa fight scene. Yeah, where uh, the Iowa fight scene. You know, scene. Bettendorf and all that, which was a huge MMA scene for a while. And now you rarely ever hear about guys coming out. Like Elvis Mutopchic is sort of a weird throwback as a guy who came, one of the last guys to come up through the Militic system. And then continue on to an elite level yeah but uh we also on this card i wanted to I, you know we segued to that by skipping over talking about jessica andraj who this was absolutely her coming out party that yeah. i feel like we've been really waiting on in the ufc to see that point where it's like can she turn the corner from a dominating regional fighter into a dominating UFC fighter. Yeah, I think Andraj has, has arrived, looked fantastic. Really excellent uh like the new weight class is going to suit her. She looks like she's going to be a powerhouse uh at that weight. And Jessica Penne, man, like she's she's hit the wrong side of the 10 year mark in her career or she's coming up on the 10 year mark in her career she's at the wrong side of the nine year mark like the decline mark fighting a weight class up and it's really starting to show with back-to-back -back yeah. just destructions yeah it is getting to the point with penne's career where she's been fighting long enough that after taking heavy amounts of damage in her last two fights you really have to wonder it's like is this going to be something that she can bounce back from? Or is this just going to be, you know, where she ends up getting cut after another bad performance and drifts off into the regional scene to fight it out for a few more years until she can't anymore? Well, I mean, like, and also it's like, on top of that, keep in mind that she was an atom weight fighter in Invicta. Yeah. She moved up to get into the UFC and she just hasn't. Like she does not actually looks that good at that weight. Um, she did the Ultimate Fighter, and then she's won. She won a split decision in the UFC, and then it's just gotten just wrecked in her like two like last two fights. Like it's it's I I'm thinking aging curve, um, fighting a weight class up. Yeah, like just a lot of factors coming together, to just like make Jessica Penne on the wrong side of it. And Andraj like looked phenomenal in this in her taking a part of it. But, and uh, I'm looking forward to seeing her getting in there with some other straw weights, like some top flight straw weights again. Like if we run back the Raquel Pennington fight, you know, Pennington's kind of on a little bit of a, a upward trend here, but I don't know if Pennington wants a piece of that Andraj that came out. Well, yeah, but at 135, I think, I think that there may be have been an actual could be a potential confidence issue at play for Andrage, mm -hmm. where she may have been fighting as relentless as foolishly aggressively as she was at one thirty five because she felt like she was fighting at such a physical disadvantage could be um yeah. because the fighter that came out against. Penne was much smarter in measuring like when to attack, when to sit back, when to flurry, when to stop, and when you know being smart about it. And in her fight, like in, in her Pennington fights, and in uh, Pennington fight, and just in general at 
featherweight. It just didn't seem like she had the ability to do that even. Mm -hmm. And it it may have been partially too, because when she would step in against fighters at 135 and start throwing, they could tie her up really easily because they were so much bigger than her. And at 115, they just can't. She's powerful enough that she can just push off, post off and go, you know, regain the center of the cage and actually show a little more craft because she's not just getting, swallowed up by fighters that are six inches taller than she is yeah i think it's one of those things that like i think i think the new weight class is just suiting her really well um Mm -hmm. because you the pennington fight to me is the one where it's like she got she got a look she got like physically crowded in that fight yeah and just wasn't didn't seem to be able to like get off much offense because she like was just being physically overwhelmed against the fence and now i agree with you now she is kind of like the physical force um and like she I, i'm i'm looking forward to seeing her in this new weight class and seeing what she can do because um she looked outstanding and i i think penny yeah i think penny is still a good litmus test even though like we're talking about her being on the wrong end of things it's just fighting elite straw weights maybe not penny's thing right now yeah well either way i hope she takes a bunch of time off and really yeah. just, you know if she's gonna keep going Take a year off and do something else. Let yourself heal up. Then try coming back. Don't rush right back in and try and get back a win real quick because that that seems to be where fighters often get really in trouble is just taking fight after fight when they're get when they're losing badly. Yeah. Anyway, otherwise worth knowing on noting on this last card uh sean strickland tom breeze what you know prospect prospect fight to some degree breeze being the much more notable uh higher still really a prospect i mean strickland well strickland's in that weird position fighting forever but he's also only 25 yeah it's hard to know like I expect Strickland to continue generally improving and being good for another five or six years. Yeah, I would agree with that. I, I think, but I don't know that he's ever going to jump up and be an elite fighter in the division. Yeah, this fight was a one where like neither fighter really got out of first gear. Um, yep, neither guy really got their game going. Um, if I'm remembering correctly, I think live I scored it for Breeze, but I had no problem with Strickland winning i yeah i scored it for strickland i i thought that strickland did enough to take the first two rounds it it, it's not something i would dig in on because no. i thought it was fine and for breeze if nothing else this this is fine for him because it lets him go back and continue to work on some of his craft and continue to work on aspects of his game uh that need improving without being continually run up the uh run up the uh the ladder and it wasn't a bad loss for him it was a nice close competitive fight and he just like i think this was this fight for both guys was kind of a headspace one like strickland is very a very conservative fighter um yep where you know he after the fight he talked about how he wanted it to be a brawl but breeze kept backing up but i mean like strickland is not the guy to go out there and like set the pace of a fight he follows whatever pace it a guy sets for the fight and breeze got out there and he seemed a little put off by something in this fight. Yeah. I just, I, I think I expected it to be kind of a staring contest mm-hmm. when it was announced or like when I was actually looking at it and breaking it down because Strickland is so conservative and does not commit much. And breeze is frankly a pretty low output striker. Like if he can't hurt you with a punch, he's not going to like put together some great four piece combo. He tends to, if he throws more than two strikes, he tends to start falling off balance and has to reset. He can't really keep a high output, high pace. And that just is made, you know, you have one guy who's going to be thinking about how to best protect himself and staying circling away and, you know, really picking his spots. And then you have a guy who breeze may hit harder, may have better mechanics, but really doesn't and can't throw more than one or two strikes at a time, and you're, you're destined for a, a slow-paced st- striking staring contest on the feet. And it I just sucked to me that it didn't end up being a ground battle. That was what I was hoping for. Yeah. For one of them to decide that they really wanted to test the, the other one on the ground, but 
Strickland apparently wanted a brawl, which screw that. I really don't need to see two grapplers kickboxing. That's not the highlight of my memory. Not good. So I, I think Bree still has the higher ceiling, and I agree it's not a terrible loss for him. It's just it show it, it should be the kind of thing that shows him that he really needs to have more focus on being a better combination kickboxer. Yeah. Because he's got the power. He's got the mechanics. It's just not clicking to something that's dangerous against fighters that he can't hurt with one punch. Um, otherwise, Brian Ortega is the other guy we got to talk about a bit. Oh, I was going to say, yeah, as long as we're talking about guys, too. Um, I've, we forgot about him in the preview, but Jonathan Wilson probably also. Yeah, Jonathan I mean, Wilson, Luis Enrique De Silva, that's... I don't know. It's just such a horrible slop fight between. It was. Two guys. It was. I saw some things from Wilson that I liked. Yes. I think the the biggest thing here is Wilson. Wilson suffered badly from coming up through Gradier Challenge and fighting just a bunch of just terrible cans. Yeah. When he finally got pushed back in a fight, it it didn't really go his way. He didn't really like. He he seemed very much one of those like powerful athlete. Uh, strikers who like hit the guy a couple times like oh crap he's not going down what do I do sort of moments but as early as he is in his career I think this is something that can be overcome for him um, but yeah losing to Henrique da Silva not good because he's not like a great well, athlete or he's tough though man he looked and he looked he looked pretty good in terms of like I mean Wilson was there to be kicked, and and if there's something Silva does well, it's kick really hard. Yeah, Henrique de Silva is. It was basically a pure kicker against a pure puncher, mm -hmm. and uh, Henrique de Silva is the kind of guy that I would really love to see what he can do and where he can go with a better. Like if he got into a really good elite camp, mm -hmm. what they could do with him because he's got the. It seems like he has the aggression and toughness part, like in spades, and the size of a light heavyweight. So it's just like, could a better camp really start to collect and put some finesse on his game? Yeah. Um, because at light heavyweight, even if you're not an amazing athlete, you, there's at least a space for you if you're that kind of tough, consistent, high output striker. Mm -hmm. Um but yeah, I mean the Wilson fight. Wilson, I, I liked what a lot of what he did with his his striking, his elbows and his boxing. They both like he had a lot of places where he looked sharp, but it's just a little bit too limited uh, to easily take fights. The light heavyweight's an impossibly tough division to learn how to fight in. Yeah, and he's got to learn how. Like he came up crushing cans. He's now had basically two pro fights, so he's got a lot to learn. Um, but yeah, otherwise, well, I, I guess we should actually talk Dariush before we talk Ortega. Yeah, I was, I was, <laughs> I didn't want to cut you off again, but I was like, oh yeah, there's Dariush. Yeah, the Dariush Vic fight, um, man, Dariush looked fantastic in that fight. Just absolutely took James Vic, who's like a prospect killer apart. And Dariush is like past the point of being a prospect. He but is. He, he's. He's in that in-between phase where he's not really a prospect anymore, but he hasn't really quite cemented himself as a contender. I, I really loved this fight because I thought that it was a really important step for Dariush and an important stamp for him to put down that he is actually a relatively elite lightweight. Because I saw people who were like, I've never thought that Dariush is very good and he doesn't impress me and he never has. And it's like, he... He is a actual decisive step above the division, and he needed to face a guy like Vic, who's been working his way up to the division quietly. Has been a good, consistent, um, strong fighter at lightweight, and to have Darius just go out there and be like, "No, I'm way, way better than you." I think that that was important. It was important for Darius to reassert that. Yeah. I agree. It was a great fight for him. It's going to launch him back into the upper tier, or, or like on the the like the edge of the upper tier of the lightweight division. Get him a big fight. It was a perfect performance for him. And I'm glad. I, I also feel like it may have been a good wake up call for Vic, who was starting to talk about himself as being an elite lightweight, to 
go out and face an elite, an elite fighter finally and just be like, no, look, you have a long way to go. Like, yeah. you, you need this stopping point right now for somebody to show up and be like, you got some shit to work on. Because he's got the size. and Because he's, he's got, got some shit to work on. He's got some shit to work on. But he's big and tough enough to be a difficult test for a lot of fighters. Oh, but yeah. I think, you know, he, he was... He needed. He was starting to fall into a bit of that Cajal Pendred trap, where Pendred was talking about like, you know, oh, I'm a test for anyone in this division. It's like, okay, now let's actually put you in there against some really tough fighters, and suddenly you're getting smoked. Yeah. Yep. All right. We can't avoid him anymore. Brian Ortega. Brian Ortega. Uh, so we both coming into this thought that this was like the most favorable matchup Ortega could get that he was yes. going to run shop on Clay Guida. And yet he chose the most difficult path to beating Clay Guida. And in classic Brian Ortega fashion, like commenced in giving away two rounds before actually finishing the fight. Uh, it should be noted, he was not – he was know, in, the, in the scorecards entering the third round. Entering the third round, he was not losing on the scorecards. He, he did lose a full round and a half of striking to Clay Guida in 2016, though. Yeah, and I would argue I felt that Guida should have taken that second round. I mean, you can he he landed the harder shots. Apparently, you know, the strike output was fairly even. It was uh, Fight Magic would, had them at 25 strikes each landed in the second round. Yeah, so it was fairly even and he landed the harder shots. So there's a good argument that he should have taken it, but I also thought that Guida was doing a consistent job of backing him down and yeah. that I don't know. Like I, I had no trouble. I personally, when I was watching it, did not think he did anything to win that second round in any decisive way. Yeah, no, it was. Um, I like. I understand Ortega's trying to work on his striking. Mm -hmm. That's not the kind of performance that gives me confidence that it is evolving. Well, um, I, I should say I think the problem there too is that now he's a top. Like, I want to say he's ranked like ninth now in at featherweight. Oh, he he's a top me? ten ranked featherweight now. So after this, it's you know Dennis Bermudez, Ricardo Lamas, Charles Oliveira, like those are the fights in his immediate future. Yeah. Jeremy Stevens, like these are the people sitting in front of him, and that fight does not give me any confidence about those fights. Like I. Yeah. I'm, I, I feel like he is taking steps forward. Ortega has shown improvement. Um, but it's not at the level to hang with those guys. But, like, yeah, he has run up to the top. He's running into the elite of the division and now getting to a point where, like, Tavares, Brandau, and Guida are a – alongside, like, Seaver and Cole Miller, these guys are – good veterans but they are a solid step below the elite of that division yeah no it's um and even ortega like compared to like the fighting the veterans on there he wasn't remotely as impressive as alex caceres was in taking apart cole miller to my great to my great uh uh remorse i don't know that made that fight made me sad uh but the um like, Ortega just didn't look really all that good until Clay Guida started running out of gas in the third round because Guida's been fighting for 13 years. Like, I know a lot of people are really high on Brian Ortega. He's got really dynamic jiu-jitsu, and I know jiu-jitsu people, so they get really excited about it. I get it. I think he's going to be a perfectly fine action fighter for the UFC. I don't think he's – I don't think he remotely belongs in the top ten right now. Um I don't think he's going to be able to hang with guys in that top 15 range. Just looking at it, uh, Kawajiri is maybe the one dude I would pick Ortega over going in there. And there's a couple he, other dudes that probably have a good shot against Hawker and DS2. The featherweight has some weirdness to yeah. it where, like, there's a couple of fighters, Kawajiri and Diaz, who yeah. have been ranked based on kind of on non UFC resume. Yeah, and have yet to fail hard enough to fall out of those rankings. But like you put him in there, right? And what the other thing about Ortega is that this—he's at the six-year point year point in his career. Like, I don't know if we're going to be seeing big gains from him. He took all 2012 off, but 
I don't think really, he hasn't he doesn't have a lot of fights for a guy at the six point year in his career, but he's not like b- drastically below average either. Yeah. He's like eleven fights, six years, so he's fighting about twice a year. Okay, if you put him in there with like some of these guys in there, and he's gonna get touched up, like Cub Swanson's gonna ice him in a, in a round. Clay Guida dropped him. I mean, that's the thing. Clay Guida dropped him to start this fight. And if that's Ricardo Lamas, I do not feel like Brian Ortega survives. No. I mean, so it's one of those things that in terms of just the only, the only fight where he really looked like an a otherworldly athlete and like a, just a really excellent fighter was the fight he popped in. Um, and yeah. so my, my kind of feeling on him is just this, I, I, I feel like, um, he, he's probably a mid-level fighter, but I'm not getting my expectations up for him because I, I feel like at this point he hasn't really earned his way into this into this company, and there's going to be a hard wall. And we said earlier there's going to be a hard wall for him, um, and he's going to pull out a submission win or two that that people don't see coming. Like that's going to be what happens, but he just reminds me a lot of Charles Oliveira. Like well, you know, it's a less athletic Charles Oliveira and a less well-rounded Charles Oliveira. You, you know what? It, his rise actually reminds me a lot of is the rise of Miles Jury, who a lot of people also got very excited about, and who was very young and came in on a great hot streak and did really well, marching up the UFC division. And, you know, he beat Diego Sanchez and Takanori Gomi. He got an early win over Michael Johnson. And he, you know, it was a legit run. And then he fought Donald Cerrone. And that's kind of where I feel like Ortega is headed. Is yep. that, And then he fought Charles Oliveira. And in both those fights, he was just, in, jury was just immediately outclassed. And that's kind of... That, that's a little bit of what I'm I'm worried about. I, let me put it this way. I like I like Ortega just fine. I do not want him to fail. I just I am not I am concerned that yeah, he is quickly leaping in to very deep water. Yep. I would put that too. Like it's one of those things that I get in these discussions with people I'm like, why don't you like Brian Ortega? It's like I like him just fine. I just don't think he's like a future top five title contender guy. Yeah. And you can't he's say that about a guy on the internet and right not now. hate him, huh? And he's brushing against that right now. Yeah, the and, and he, they like him because he's got, like, star potential. He's associated with the Gracies. He's got a slick ground game. There's a yeah. lot there that's marketable. There's a lot there that grabs people. He wins fights in exciting ways. But you can't – in, in – in, uh, is, there, is there a fight that he hasn't popped for for steroids in the UFC – where he didn't lose the first round? Probably not. And, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, he got he he got beat badly by Tavares and Brandau and Guida in the first round. Yeah, and then arguably, I think in both the, in all three of those fights, lost the second round. Like, we're talking about a guy who very reasonably, if not for, like the judges at this event, we can the, – the judges at this event are a whole different story because there were funky scorecards coming in all over the place that night. Um, but very reasonably could be said that he has not won a first and second round in his UFC career. Uh, that's not going to continue to be a winning strategy. Yeah, it's true. So on that note, let's take a look around the regional scene a bit since we've basically got nothing, you know, there's no UFC card coming up and, uh, we don't have a lot else going on. And a few fighters fighting out in the regional. The, the first foremost we want to talk about is this Kike Brito guy in Brazil. And actually, I didn't even look where he's fighting because I am that kind of awesome. He's fighting him. in uh, oh, what's the uh, uh, MP fight uh, in uh, in Brazil? Yeah, but uh, so yeah, Kike Brito fighting. Um, Renato Giovanni, Giovanni, who's three one and one at NP fight in Brazil, and Brito is a nineteen year old Brazilian fighter. Um, and holy shit, <laughs> he looks really good. He's a kid that, like, I, 
Ah, oh, what fight of his did we watch? Did you send me? It yeah, was, it's, it's his. Um, uh, it is his fight with uh, Luis. Uh, looks like the nickname is Carco. It's his last fight. Yeah, it's his it, most recent it, it, fight. His last and, um, fight in Arena Fire Fight Luis Champion. Gustavo, Luis Gustavo, uh, and holy, sh he he kind of has a Yair Rodriguez sort of thing going on with just like. Yeah. Insane flying offense and just like a flare to him and is in just complete control of the whole fight. He, well, he, he tried to pet his the the pet the Showtime kick off the cage, but because his opponent he like his opponent didn't move with it, he ended up jumping over his opponent. He went, like, yeah, went straight over his opponent. Like I, I'm not like I haven't seen enough of this kid to make a real determination on like where he's going to be as a fighter in terms of like, is he a future champion? But this kid's going to end up somewhere where you're going to see his fights the way yeah. he's fighting. He looks like just a, a physical phenom and with the kind of, ta the kind of timing to his athleticism that, you know, even if a lot of the baseline technique this is why, especially like the IR career, uh, the IR uh, Rodriguez comparison where it's like, e even if all the technical tools aren't there, he looks like he's athletic enough to just make it work for him. Like yeah. it doesn't really matter. He'll be able to put get get himself and blow through whatever bad positions he gets put in for a while. Yeah. Um. I hope he he Sherlock has him training out of black tie team. Yeah. Which I have not never heard of. Know nothing nope. about. He, yeah. Oh man, Brazil is full of fight teams that like. Yeah. So that's not a great sign, but you know it's not like there aren't other good big teams in Brazil. So I really hope that this kid shows up, you know, on some coach's radar, whether it's Novo now or uh, Nogueira team or Shoot the Box or something like that, or can get up to ATT or Kings to some of the other, you know, well Brazilian connected gyms up north and up in the states and can really put together some good training to go with this game because he looks he looks like a really fun prospect to watch. Yeah. Uh another another match worth talking about here uh is oh another fighter is Andre Harrison's gonna be fighting in Titan. Uh yep. probably one of the better uh American featherweight prospects out there. Uh he's been around for a little bit is uh in his yeah his fifth year of professional fighting um still putting together his game but is coming off a win over uh ufc veteran steven seiler so they beat steven seiler des green kurt hollabaugh and cody bollinger all in a row oh and yeah, yeah. He's, fighting. He, he's he's put together quite a little run of like former um sir, former ufc fighters and titan is starting to look starting to look pretty solid yeah, now he's up next. He's facing longtime ATT uh, Sapo fight team vet Davison Francisco Ribeiro, who started fighting back in two thousand seven. One of those, one of those regional Brazilian guys who wins like eight out of every ten fights they take. On uh, has never quite gotten a won enough fights to get to the elite level. Yeah, but that should be. I mean, I keep waiting for. The UFC to pull the trigger. I, I'm guessing what keeps stalling them on Harrison is that he has yet to prove himself to be a consistent finisher against good competition. Yeah, got this very power grinding wrestling style. Yeah, where he just doesn't generate a lot, enough, quite enough striking offense to hurt guys enough to put him away. He's a great controlling physical force, but not necessarily a uh, knockout-driven fighter. Yeah, another one, uh, if we're talking knockout-driven fighters, uh, Emmanuel Rivera is going to be fighting on HD MMA in Oklahoma. A um, little bit older of a fighter, but uh, very clearly a an experienced striker. Um, he's been fighting MMA, it looks like, on and off amateur wise since 2013 but went pro in 2015 and both of his fights have been rather resounding knockouts including one in legacy uh not too long ago um last september it looks like so uh really pretty good athlete and a pretty clean striker who who puts people down but hasn't faced like the 
best of competition yet. So he's one to you know, be interested to watch. Also worth noting, one of our top scouted featherweights, uh, Levon Makishvili, is back on the regional scene fighting for CES this oh. weekend. He got oh. cut from the UFC after going 1-1-1, one, one, one. His, losing his opening fight to uh, Hakran Diaz, I believe. Yeah. And then uh, beating... God, I don't even remember who he beat. He beat... Uh, yeah. Oh, he, he be, uh, won his opening fight against Markadiva, then lost to Hakran Diaz, both by split decision, and then had a draw with Damon Jackson. And then after that draw, both he and Damon Jackson, it looks like, got cut. So Makashvili still has kind of failed to find consistent, aggressive form in his UFC career. Like, a lot of his fights were marked by him acting like he was doing a lot better than he was in fights. Yeah. Um, not good quite full Bobby best. greening it, but mm-hmm. not full, not not like full Bobby greening it, but like no. fighting as if in a manner that he was ahead. Yeah, just like you know, kind of letting his guard down before he was out of range, or just toying with an opponent while they were still landing offense, and not quite figuring out, like, not quite doing the right things to win rounds as much as he was uh, maybe physically able to. So I'm, I'm interested to see what he can do now that he's been kicked back to the curb. He only started, I don't know, it's kind of hard to track his career. He started as a pro officially in 2013, but he was basically doing pro MMA back in Georgia yeah, uh, before moving to the U.S., so that career is largely unrecorded, and I'm not sure how far back it stretches. Yeah. All right, a couple more guys. Um, uh, Darko Stosic uh, out of Serbia is going to be fighting uh, in f- the final fight championship in the main event. He's a heavyweight. He's a he's not huge for heavyweight, but he's really powerfully built. He's like a little fire plug at six feet and like 230. Um, so maybe a future light heavyweight if he – Yeah, if he can really- – Think about cutting. Yeah, and uh, sling some leather, heavy top position sort of guy. In the U.S., Dale Soapy uh, is uh, like an undersized heavyweight. Looks like kind of like a fighting to get into shape sort of dude. Mm. Um, but he trains out of power MMA and is like wrestling on the regular with like Ryan Bader and guys like that. Has good power and is a surprisingly good athlete. Like he's known for his – he's like able to elevate on head kicks and knocks out dudes with head kicks at heavyweight. Um, so he might be worth checking out. Uh, Nakoi Inyo in Japan and deep looked like a pretty solid fighter. Uh, and Leo Lente, yeah. yeah, a former Brazilian national judo team also competed in jujitsu now making a go of it in MMA had two or had won three straight bouts in legacy. And now he's fighting in this final fight championship. Um, he very much has the Dan Kelly vibe to him of like that sort of not exciting, but solid old man strength thing yeah. going on. Um, and then, uh, is it tell noons, uh, is fighting who is, uh, a really sharp striker for women's MMA, like not even just for women's MMA, just in general, good hands, good kicks, throws combinations, usually ends it on a kick and had that like highlight reel, um, knockout where she basically threw like three head kicks in a row like she was kicking pads after she had someone hurt and uh, dropped her. I'm trying to remember who that was. Uh, Caroline Martins uh, just dropped poor Caroline Martins with like a barrage of three lightning quick head kicks. Um, and she's definitely... coming up at straw weight, which is always a thing, you know, always worth watching in MMA, looking out for the next, you know, for good straw weights, good bantam weights, women on the rise, because, you know, UFC's always needing talent for those divisions. Yeah. And then um, Cross Kenneth, or Kenneth Cross over mm-hmm. in uh, KOP in, is this going down in Michigan? Yeah, this is the Michigan card. So knockout promotions, Kenneth Cross. Uh, only one fight so far in his career, but looks like a fairly decent athlete. But the guys in, uh, yeah, no. So 
looks pretty good. Um, kind of you know, a few regional things going on. People to watch, especially uh, Harrison, who's got to be – if he can find a finish, I got to think he'll be on his way to the UFC. Yeah. Um, if he – you know, and then guys like Kaikrito, who may be two or three years away from the UFC, but if they can keep racking up wins, who <laughs> knows? And somebody like Estella Nunez – you know, women's women fighter like she she started in 2015. If she gets like one more win, she could be in the UFC next month. You know, or mm -hmm. in three months, they pick up people really early for the women's side of things. Yep. All right. All right. On that note, you can find me on Twitter at these ain't time. You can find Tom on Twitter at tp underscore grant. You can find both of us over at bloodyelbow.com as well as Tom occasionally over at Flow Combat. Yeah, and I think uh, I'm, I might be back at Buddy Elbow a little bit soon. All right, so he, he's kicking around out there. Um, give this video a like if you enjoyed it. That's a thumbs up. And subscribe to MMANation.com, D-O-T-C-O-M, over on YouTube. Both those things help us a bunch. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in. Uh, I don't know what other shows we'll have coming at you this week. I don't even think I'm doing a Viva section because there's no real regional shows to, to plug other than the Titan one and... I don't know. Like, uh, we'll ha we'll be back next week for all the Ottawa stuff to talk about. So we'll have a vivid section. Care don't care, um, and breakdowns. Knuckle up will be coming at you ne next week if I did it. All that good stuff. So thanks everyone for tuning in, and we'll see you next time.